Okay. <laughs> good morning, and it's so good to see you all. A little chilly out there, but the sun is shining, so that's a good thing. And the sun is shining here this morning with a special welcome to Reverend Burke and May Radford. Burke, it's all yours. The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Good morning. good morning. And it's so good to be back in Ryerson with all our friends here. If I may speak on behalf of May, which I'm very careful when I do, uh, we are both pleased to be here and be with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And welcome to all of you on behalf of the board and the congregation to Ryerson United Church. On Look, the sun is beginning to break through. Ryerson is an inclusive Christian congregation, uh, and uh, we share our spiritual journey with one another, and we serve the community as best we are able. Be sure that you have a welcome here this morning, and a welcome to the folks from Bethesda who are with us this morning. It's good to have our companion congregation here with us at Ryerson Church. Now, Rick, who made the journey up to welcome me, which I was thankful for, uh, is going to present the uh, reminders for the day. A, a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, uh, our uh, prayers and blessings are with Janet and uh, and Brad Randall and the Randall family on the passing of, of Janet's father-in-law this week. Also, uh, you'll note that Barbara is not here again today, but she's doing well. Now uh, she's at home, and she actually suffered a, if there's any such thing as a small heart attack, uh, and uh, kind of related to uh, her uh, her diabetes as well. But she's on the mend. And we hope to see her back there next week. Uh, the other announcement I have to make, and I'll get Joan to, there you go. So we're going to have, we've had some discussions in council about some social events we can do. So what we're going to do on Sunday, February 25th, after uh, the service, we're going to have a special Greek celebration. We're going to have a full Greek dinner here, catered by Ios, which uh, if any of you haven't been there, it's, it's just an amazing Greek restaurant in Upper James. The food is fantastic, and uh, so we're going to have a full Greek dinner, and then we're going to have uh, some guest speakers who are from the congregation talk about their their journeys to Greek. I think it'll be a, a, a great uh, dinner, uh, so we're hoping that all of you will sign up for that. There is a cost associated with it, but it's about twenty dollars per person. But I can tell you it'll be well worth it. So we look forward to that. February 25th, but it's very important that you at least let Lynn know so we know how much food to get. It's all catered by Iris. And without any further ado, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. May and I certainly share uh, the sympathy and condolences to Janet and Brad and the whole family and the passing of Janet's father. Um, reading his obituary, it was, um, it was enlightening to see what this man had done for the community, having been uh, nominated and appointed Citizen of the Year uh, for Caledonia just a short time ago. His service to the United Church and to the Masons and to the community is deeply appreciated by all, and I'm sure our condolences go to uh, Janet and Brad and the family. Ryerson United Church affirms that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. It's covered by the traditional by the Upper Canada Treaties, as is within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon, Wampum Grim. 
We are thankful for the enduring presence of indigenous people in this land. Jesus said that if you walk in the light, you will have communion one with another. The community of this church and every church is based ultimately on the light of Christ in our lives and in the church. Let us share together in the responsive call to worship. Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and the Word of God revealed to you. Rejoice, people of God, and worship the one who is our wisdom and our strength. People of God, since the beginning of time, God has not ceased to speak to us and to call us to fuller, more authentic life. If we say with Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, God will speak his saving word to us. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I neglected to say in my opening comments that the focus of the worship today is on two passages of Scripture uh, which uh, relate the, God's calling to his servants. The first to the boy Samuel, and the second to Nathaniel. God reveals his presence as we now adore him and with all appear before him. Our hymn is number 391, God Reveal Your Presence.
So we have two younger folks with us today, and you're quite welcome, we're glad you've come. So I want to just talk especially just to you for a minute. I hope Santa found you. Did you get some presents? Oh good, there's smiles there. I'm sure they were very nice. Santa's a nice fellow, isn't he? Well, I got a special present, and everybody here got this present. You did too. You might not know about it. Here it is. It's a calendar for next year. And Jillian made a special point to bring this calendar to me, and I appreciated it. She sort of acted like Santa Claus. Now, it's not just a calendar. Look, it's got blanks all through it, little blank squares. Each one, of course, as you know, represents a day. In next year, 365 minus 14. That's the days we've got left. And each one of those days is a special gift from God for us to use for, well, lots of things. Going to school, of course, is important. Going to work, for those of us that do. And uh, having fun and playing is very important. And, and uh, sort of with the family, spending time with the family. These things are all important and they're all gifts from God because God gives us 365 days every year to just do what is good for us and good for others and good for God. Thanks to God for his presence. And now we come to the reading of the scriptures and Shirley is going to read the first two lessons for us. Let us pray. Eternal God, open our minds to hear your word, our hearts to love your word, and our lives to be responsive to your word. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of the living Christ. Amen. A little shorter. The first reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be. If he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called us at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. That was our first reading. Our second reading is uh, Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 to 6, 
and 17 and 18. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquired with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset behind me and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Thank you, Shirley. We go on with the reading of scriptures now with the Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, his first letter, reading in chapter 6. Now, um, I'm sure the affidavits will prove that I sent the wrong chapter number to Lynn, and uh, the real one is 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 14. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both, one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord Jesus, and will also raise us by his power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then we turn in the gospel, as I mentioned, to the calling of Nathanael. John 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, well, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Two stories of Jesus calling, of God calling people. The very popular story from Sunday school days of God calling the young lad Samuel in the middle of the night, and the story of Jesus calling Nathaniel. 
I'm sure that all of us who went to Sunday school uh, remember the story of the calling of Samuel. It was such an attractive story for Sunday school teachers to teach because it was all about a little boy, probably as young as the folks we have here today, and of God's particularly seeking out this child and, and calling him in the night. Samuel was living in the temple. That had come about because his mother, Hannah, had been childless for many years and was so grateful when she uh, became pregnant and bore a child that she dedicated him to the Lord and sent him off to serve in the temple with Eli, the priest. Now, this is not the temple at Jerusalem that we, are, uh, we know today is, is still standing. This is a temple or even a shrine might be a word for it, uh, in Shiloh, a city in North Israel, uh, about parallel to the Sea of Galilee, but on the coast of the Mediterranean. It was established by Joshua, the general who was uh, uh, led the conquest of Canaan by the Israelite people. It was there that he administrated the newly subdued country and established there a temple to the Lord. And Joshua brought the Ark of the Covenant, the very most central symbolism of the Judaism or the Israeli nation at that time, the central symbol of the presence of God. And he brought that to the temple at Shiloh, where it was when Samuel was living there. Now, as the story begins, Samuel is actually sleeping in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. And Eli is in a bedroom somewhere else. Um, it's pretty evident from the story that Eli's eyesight is fading sounds almost he may be slipping into some dementia. He's past his best, um, best before date, and he's struggling to keep up. And little Samuel is taking over and guarding the ark in the night. God speaks to Samuel, calls him, confused. Samuel goes three times to Eli, thinking it's Eli. Eli finally realizes there's something going on in this lad's mind. And so he says, he tells him to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Samuel does. And from the depths of his soul, he is led on a very negative mission. What God wants him to do is to tell Eli that his term is over. He's finished. Reality has set in and he can no longer serve as judge and priest of Israel. The judges were charismatic leaders. You see, at this time, the, the Jewish nation, the nation of the children of Israel, as it was called, was a loose confederation of 12 tribes, each with its territory, and judges would arise. These would be charismatic leaders who would pull the people together in the face of an enemy and lead into battle. Gideon, Deborah are examples. And they gradually evolved into judges administrating the justice system of the 12 tribes. And as we see in Eli, the role of judge, military leader, and priest all merged into one. So you can see that his role was quite pivotal in the well-being of the country, but now he was passing into the period of time when he could no longer serve well. And essentially what God was doing was calling the lad Samuel to take his place. And that's exactly what happened as history unfolded. But there's a little word, a little sentence there in this story that intrigues me and I think connects this story to us today in the 21st century. Here it is. 
The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. I said Eli was incapable. He had suffered too from uh, questions of his integrity and his son's corruption and the word of the Lord was rare. People were not paying attention to the temple, to the worship of God and to the leadership of God. There was a lack of, of national cohesion, a, a lack of willingness to sacrifice for the nation. The political tribes had become political entities searching for their own good rather than the good of the larger people and the will of God. The uh, book of Judges history of this period ends with these words, all the people did what was right in their own eyes, in their own eyes. There lacked a common value in the country that the people could all coalesce around and, and work together to serve one another in the country. Everyone just did whatever he thought or she thought was right. Does this sound familiar? I thought when I was reading, I might be reading about our age and our day. Partisan bickering, widening divisions in views, the rise of hatred for races. Um, we seem to have collectively slipped our moral moorings and our sort of drifting in a sea of half-truths and falsehoods and, dare I say it, ignorance. The word of the Lord is rare. Visions are few. Has God fallen silent? Or have we stopped listening? Or like Samuel, are we confused about who is speaking to us? And we listen to the cacophony of voices from our world today and we get mixed up as to what's truth and what's real and what word we should follow. It, it happens in a personal level too. We need to stop and think, are we really listening to one another? Or are we simply trying to frame a defense for our own views when someone presents something with which we don't feel we agree? Are we just focused on our own opinions and unable to truly consider the opinions of others? Are we so focused on our own benefit that we will like those people in Regina and we mustn't point the fingers at any, any city because every city, every town has this problem driving by a man dying on the street and not stopping. There's anyone with speech impairment will know that there's a difference between hearing and listening. You can hear a person speaking, but you can't listen to what they're saying because you can't put any kind of context into what they're saying and you can't get the words. Now that's a pretty good analogy I expect to our attempting to understand God. Well, God speaks in many ways. God speaks in the depths of our minds in meditation in our reading of scripture, in our listening to scripture, in the worship services. God speaks to us in the hymns, familiar hymns we've sung all our lives that strike a chord in our hearts. God speaks in nature. I know many have cottages and the weekend pilgrimage and the summer pilgrimage to the cottage is a part of our lives, isn't it? I, I had a group of friends, we, we called ourselves the Amigos, and we went camping 
uh, canoe and tent into the back country of Algonquin Park and other uh, wilderness areas in Ontario. Well, we don't do that anymore. The old bones won't get down to get into a tent. We can't carry the canoes anymore. So we go to a friend's cottage. Well, I was sitting out uh, on the last night we were going to be at the cottage, and I wrote down some of my thoughts, as I sometimes do. Listen to my account of the last night at this cottage. The amigos had hit the hay, conked out, turned in, call it quits. I alone sit beside the still lake and regard the stars with awe. There is no sound save the snap and sputter of the dying fire, the occasional flutter of a night creature flying in the dark. The motors are still. They no longer stir the placid surface of the lake. The laughter of children has been snuffed out by the school bell sounding far away. Cottage country has conked out too and waits the winter's infinite silence. And I alone remain awake to mourn its passing and to listen for the whisper of the God of creation. It was God who broke the silence in the land of Israel to a little boy, an innocent little child. It was God who reached out to one servant who was capable of listening. And I believe God will break the silence that we impose on our society and on ourselves. And we need to listen to the voice of God. Well, quickly, a parallel story in the Gospels, the calling of Nathaniel. Jesus was recruiting. He had just begun his ministry. He had just been baptized. He's gathering followers. He gathers Andrew and Peter and Philip. And Philip goes to a, a friend named Nathaniel and says, Oh, look, we have found Messiah. Come, we found Messiah. And Nathaniel says, Oh, and Philip says, He, he comes from Nazareth. And Philip says, Can any good come out of Nazareth? The voice of a hardened cynic who has t bought into the bad reputation of Nazareth, the garrison town. Can any good come out of Nazareth? He dismisses what Philip is. Philip says, come and see. So he does. And when Jesus sees him coming, he says, look, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Hmm. Jesus seems to see more in Nathaniel than he might see in himself. But Nathaniel's still grumpy. You don't, how do you know me? He said to Jesus. Oh, Jesus said, I, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. And Nathaniel thinks for a moment and then says, indeed, you are Messiah, the Son of God. Sitting under a fig tree, how did that change the situation? Well, it was in those times a term for happiness, contentment, and focus, much like we might say, I'm living in clover now, or I'm in a good place. The sitting under a fig tree was, was a popular saying for you're a, a good person who's relating well to others. It was a place to have contemplation and learning. And Jesus said, look, it's in a sense, Nathaniel, I know you. You are not the hard-bitten character you pretend to be. Underneath, there's a feeling, thinking person. I imagine the word of God was rare for Nathaniel, but God broke the silence. God spoke in the person of Jesus. Nathaniel's mentioned only one other time in the Gospel of John in the whole Bible. And he does not appear with the twelve disciples during the ministry of Jesus. But he does appear in that one reference in Christ's resurrection appearance to the disciples 
by the Sea of Galilee. There he is, Nathaniel. Now, none of the other Gospels don't mention him, and some scholars think it, he may be, in fact, Bartholomew, who was one of the disciples who followed Jesus. But no matter. The point is, there are anonymous saints in our world, and there's no shrine named after them, and there's no big awards given to them. They simply quietly do their service to God and do not seek recognition or reward. There are many Nathaniels in the church of our day. There are many Nathaniels in this church. I know. I've been with you for a total of about three years. And I know there are many of you that quietly do the work of God and don't seek the limelight and the recognition. God calls. We answer. And he is served. So we have two examples of God breaking the silence, examples from Scripture. There are many examples too from our lives. There are many saints who are called by God through perhaps just one miraculous instant in which they are confronted by God's call. Let me give you one illustration. Um, a, a book called Take This Bread by Sarah Miles, and she tells her life story. It's an autobiography. She was raised a, an atheist, and she spent the early part of her life as an activist among revolutionaries in South America. But she had a baby, and she wanted to, couldn't see raising her baby in the context in which she lived, so she came back to San Francisco and one Sunday morning wandered into an Anglican church and she tells, I don't know why, she said, I don't know why I did that, just curious, I guess. I sat down, the service went on, and she couldn't understand what anybody was saying, she didn't know what was going on, but then the priest offered communion and she went up to receive communion and here's how she says what happened. When the priest put the bread into my hand, saying, the body of Christ, something outrageous and terrifying happened. God called me. Her conversion from atheism was instant and lasting. She became a deacon of the church and she founded a large food pantry in the city of San Francisco and daily administrated the feeding of hundreds of hungry people. She devoted her life to sharing the bread of life and the bread of communion. God breaks the silence of our stubbornness, our insensitivity, our selfishness. God calls some to service. It may not be dramatic as the instances I've mentioned, but it can be miraculous and life-changing. But how we answer is crucial. Jesus heard the call, standing in the Jordan River after being baptized. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And he answered and gave his life in devoted service to God and the community, the people around him. He broke the silence. He brought God in a new and unique way to us, and he changed the world. And when Jesus calls us, there's really only one response. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A hymn that echoes the theme of the scriptures and the sermons, a prayer. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. We stand as we are able to sing hymn number 371, Open My Eyes.
Let us pray. Dear God, you have called us into being and created us. You have given us each a person, personal self with skills and abilities, strengths and weaknesses, the capacity to love and be loved. We thank you for who we are, for the power we have to create, the capacity we have for joy, for the will that we have to live through even the darkest days. Wise God, you have promised not to leave us without comfort, without guidance. We pray for your guiding hand to be on us now and in the future. Guide us, help us to choose when the way divides before us and we stand perplexed. Bring wisdom, understanding, and insight to our moments of decision. And when we wrestle through the dark night with anxieties and with our losses and with our grief, oh then bless us with your presence and help us to find the way. We pray for guidance for Ryerson and Bethesda churches. In the presence of the Holy Spirit, guide our thinking. Guide the thinking of our boards and committees and church meetings. Guide each person as he thinks of their commitment to the church. We pray for Jeff, the minister of this church, that he may be guided and inspired by your presence to truly speak your word and lead us. We think about the many people in need today, people overcome by the complexities and difficulties of life, homeless, friendless, alone. We commit ourselves to help to the agencies and groups working to help those in deepest need and gentle healing God. Even as Jesus gently touched the sick and needy when he met them and called them to follow him, even so, through the dedicated ministry of your church, touch the lives of those in need. We pray for friends and family, those close to us, especially to Al's family that now mourns his loss. We pray for his family, his children, Doug and Cindy, Janet and Brad, Paul and Steve. We pray for those who have depended on Al for love and guidance for so long and will be missing him now and need your care. And we pray for grandchildren, Blair and Emma and Beth, Brendan and PJ, and great-grandchildren, Charlotte and Hunter. May the succeeding generations find healing for their loss and keep the love and inspiration of this good man secure in their hearts always. Give to all people, we pray, hearts of wisdom, that we may listen to one another, that we may hear our brothers' and sisters' needs and listen to your voice. Give us hearts of love that we might cherish and not exploit the love of others that we may love rather than hate. Give us hearts of peace that the ways of war may perish from the earth. We offer our prayers in the name of Jesus who showed us the way of peace, peace with selves and peace with God. Let us share together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God
called many disciples, men and women, to travel with him, to share life with him, the unity of the Spirit, and to serve with him. And we are disciples too. He calls us, calls to light his community of faith, and calls us to share our resources in ministry with others. So with grateful heart and in mutual commitment to our church, we will present our offerings to God as we leave the sanctuary today. Let us share in a hymn of praise and thanksgiving. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Present these gifts in the love and grace of the living Christ. Amen. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. A magnificent hymn written for the opening of Riverside Church in New York City, one of the greatest Protestant churches of our time. God of grace and God of glory.